I have seen the emotional pain that families go through when the massive financial investments they have made in fertility processes do not have the outcomes they seek. What if you could do more to improve your chances of fertility outcomes? What if you could do more just to improve your own fertility health? In today's episode, the three key questions we answer are 1. How is poor sleep impactful on women and fertility? 2. How is poor sleep impactful on men and fertility? And 3. How is sleep a mediator in fertility outcomes? Fertility and sleep are very much interconnected. So much power lies within ourselves beyond the expensive treatments. Mahesh Jairaman was the ultimate choice to speak about this topic. He is a Master of Functional Blood Chemistry Analysis. He is a Certified Functional Hormone Specialist from Functional Women's Academy. He is also the co-founder of Sepalika, a practice targeted towards women's health and more specifically fertility. Let's get started. Hey everyone, I'm Deepa, Light Functional Medicine Practitioner, Author and Yogini and you're listening to the Sleep Whisperer Podcast, the only sleep podcast with conversations and meditations. I'm on a mission to share profoundly insightful sleep conversations with global visionaries that merge together functional medicine and ancient wisdom. Breathe in bliss through weekly guided meditations and let yourself enter the land of dreams. Together, let's unravel the pieces, get to the roots and understand the right tools to transform your sleep completely. Through this podcast, I want you to dream the best version of yourself. It's time to regain hope and begin your sleep journey. Mahesh Jairaman, welcome to the Sleep Whisperer Podcast and today we are talking about fertility and sleep and we are going to be answering three key questions. One is that how is poor sleep impactful on women and fertility? How is poor sleep impacting men and fertility? And also how is poor sleep a mediator in how fertility outcomes play out? So these are relevant questions, especially since fertility does seem to be challenging in many areas globally today. And I think you're the best person to talk about this simply because you're focused on this area of fertility and uh, hormonal health. So uh, let's just jump into the conversation to I'm a little surprised that a man is focused on fertility and hormonal health. So what got you into that area? Thanks so much for having me uh, on your podcast, um, Deepa. And the reason that I got into this was primarily a health challenge faced by my wife. It wasn't specifically in the area of fertility, but it did have to do with her hormonal health. And when we found that we were not getting the sort of answers we wanted from conventional medicine, that is when we turned to more holistic approach around nutrition, Ayurveda, uh, acupressure, and so on. And once I got into it, I realized how many women were actually suffering from, you know, just being handed out hormonal pills or birth control pills without even being explained all the consequences of this. And once that began to um, sort of develop into an idea and we set up Tepalika as an online fertility clinic, that is when we realized how many women go through the sort of, you know, very mechanical and sometimes, uh, not sometimes, in fact, always very expensive and painful procedures of IUI and IVF and so on. And so we decided there needs to be some sort of a via media between trying naturally and conceiving and immediate next step being going to IUI or IVF. It didn't make sense that these were the only two ends of a very small spectrum. Surely there must be something we can do in between to help these people. And that's how I got into this. And uh, touch wood till now, we've had in just the last two years, 19 Sepalika babies, all born to women who were told they will never conceive naturally after several 
failed rounds of IUI, IVF, etc. In fact, the last baby who's turned, um, not the last baby, sorry, second last baby who's turned one now, uh, came to us, uh, the parents came to us after 13 years of trying, nine IVF failed rounds, nine IUI failed rounds across three big chains, etc. But nobody had worked on their simple fundamentals. Are they eating well? Are they sleeping well? Is their thyroid working? And so on. So that's been my journey to get to this point. And I think there's so many things you said there, Mahesh. Is one of the things is mindset. And I'm always talking into this gap. So I see there's a huge gap even in the sleep world. For me, it's that there is a wide gap between someone who's sleeping really well and someone who has a sleep disorder. And this gap in the middle is something which is just missed because there's so many things going on in that realm. And to be going into what is called a tier three, where you get into these chronic uh, disease or diagnosis and treatments. And what you described was something like that in the fertility world, that there's a big gap between someone who has uh, babies easily and someone who might actually need some of those treatments like IVF, but the gap in the middle is pretty wide. And I know that this is also an emotional aspect because I've seen people go through several rounds of IVF. It's draining them financially. It's draining them emotionally because by the time they get to see each time that failure after they've invested uh, finances and themselves physically, emotionally, and then to have it one more round of failure, it's so debilitating on them. It's impactful on their relationship itself. Um, so I am so glad that you're talking about this, but let's first jump into how is poor sleep impacting women specifically? Yeah, so there is, of course, published evidence as well. So anybody just needs to go on PubMed or NIH and write sleep quality and fertility outcomes. Just use those search terms and you will find literally hundreds of studies. So yes, modern medicine also acknowledges that sleep is a very big factor when it comes to fertility. Of course, traditional holistic medicine, in any case, we always believe that all the foundations are crucial, that you know there must be a reason why something like sleep, where you are literally putting yourself in an unsafe position for at least eight hours at night where you can be easily attacked by wild animals. Now, why would that act, that kind of behavior be preserved in a modern person? Surely it must have a very big role. So we always tell our people that there are only two natural dictums as far as nature is concerned. There is preservation and there is procreation. If the problem is with procreation or reproduction, See if your preservation or your own health is fine. Everything else, career, house, etc., is all man-made. Nature just wants you to be healthy and happy and produce the next generation. Only two things are needed. In that be healthy and happy is the sleep part, which is the most crucial. One third of a 24-hour day is given by nature to that process. And when this is disturbed in women, we see at least three or four mechanisms of action or ways in which it impacts their reproductive health. And then, of course, there are all the studies that back it up that this is truly happening. Number one, which we call the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which means if you are losing sleep, the body begins to believe that you are somehow in some kind of a fight or flight state, that there is a danger to you. And therefore, your stress hormones like cortisol are produced in the excess and your sleep hormone melatonin, while it could be produced excessively initially just as a compensatory mechanism, eventually it begins to decline because naturally nature wants you to be awake to fight any threat. So how is it going to allow you to sleep? And yet it is during your sleep that you secrete the maximum amounts of growth hormone, the pulsing that happens, the um, various cleaning activities of the body, including the cleaning of the liver that takes place. The liver breaks down hormones. It does all its repair and restore work at night. And during that time as well, if we don't have proper sleep, then your hormone production, hormone metabolism, all of these get affected. The second way in which this can impact, uh, poor sleep can impact fertility, is that a fight or flight state again changes the circulatory pattern in the body. 
all non-essential functions will get turned down. So including ovarian follicle maturation will get turned down. Spermatogenesis will get turned down because the human body, as we know, is still 10,000 years old. It's the first Ford or Maruti 800 to leave the factory. It hasn't been upgraded. So whenever it sees stress, it says turn off non-essential function. So it turns off digestion, turns off reproduction. If you survive, then we will think about what to do about reproduction. That is how the body reacts naturally. So that then the blood flow to the ovaries gets restricted. That again affects ovarian um, follicular maturation. So that's the second way. The third way is, of course, um, like I described, with all the reproductive hormones, testosterone production gets turned down in men. Obviously, that has impact on reproductive health and sexual function. And finally, even the uterine health, the ability of the uterus to receive a fertilized embryo and for it to implant and grow properly, even that is impacted by poor sleep. These are all from uh, established mechanisms of action that are known to science. And like I said, there are enough and more studies that show that women, especially in shift work, like nurses, will have very um, um, different and poor fertility outcomes compared to women who are sleeping properly, sleeping enough number of hours and sleeping at the right time of the day. So there is a vast impact on female reproductive health when it comes to sleep being poor. I have two questions for you, Mahesh. One is that you spoke about liver function in the middle of the night. Now, do you notice if there's any difference regarding sleep timing? Because this is a very tricky uh, area. Recently, there has been a lot of work into differing circadian rhythms, different sleep chronotypes. So what do you, what do you feel in terms of women and fertility if they are sleeping probably eight to nine hours, but maybe it's from midnight to 8 a.m. You feel that there is a role to play in timing. Um, and of course, I wanted to also ask you uh, regarding, you did mention about, you did interview some aspects of male fertility into that, but I think we'll come to this later. All right. Okay. So absolutely, you are, you know, um, obviously you're the sleep expert. So you're bang on the data. Indeed, there is some talk about differing chronotypes, owls versus larks and so on. And there is some recent data that backs it up. However, even the world's leading sleep specialists all say that owls only have a Number one, the number of owls are far fewer in nature. People who can sleep a lot later and still wake up refreshed just by getting the same number of hours. Uh, you know, they seem to be exceptions rather than the rule. So for women to generally think that it's okay to sleep at 12 and wake up at 8, I don't think the data is supporting that yet. That is number one. Because all these shift workers, they are also getting sufficient amounts of sleep. And thanks to a lot more awareness now, they do darkened rooms and they do soundproofing and they do a lot of stuff that mimics the natural uh, sort of nighttime. But the same science is also showing us that there are uh, things which are not yet physically palpable to us or measurable to us that also affect the rhythms of your body. So the idea that the whole earth goes through a different rhythm at night not just so even gravity apparently changes mildly at the quantum level during nighttime versus morning time. The Schumann resonances, the quantum medicine that we are studying all tells us there could be things other than light and sound, which we know how to measure, which change their rhythms at night. And your body being part of nature senses that. And therefore, uh, all the circadian rhythm, the work of Dr. Panda and other such, you know, leading people in the circadian rhythm sort of world suggests that it is important that that 10 p.m. mark, those two hours between 10 p.m. and 12 a.m. do seem to make a substantial positive and negative difference, depending on whether you get to sleep or whether you don't. And so that becomes a crucial part of what we are seeing. So indeed, not just the eight hours of sleep, but when those eight hours happen, uh, modern science is ratifying what Ayurveda and other ancient sciences have always said. And do you, when you spoke about women and how it does impact their fertility, is there a way that the women can know how uh, their fertility health is? 
Yes, indeed. So, you know, one of the simplest things that we tell all women is, if you want an objective measure, right? First of all, we are all lost the ability to tune into our own bodies. Even when it comes to eating, we don't kind of listen to our bodies and eat when we are hungry, we eat by the clock. But let's say we leave that kind of awareness aside. In today's fragmented world, it's so difficult to be self-aware. If we leave that aside and we want one single objective marker, is my fertility being affected by whatever it is that I'm doing? I would say measuring serum progesterone, which is a blood test on day minus seven. So let's say you're somebody who gets regular periods on a 30 day cycle, measure serum progesterone on day 23 of your period every month. And the progesterone value, uh, happy to give some thumb rules of interpreting it, but the idea is that it should at least be in two digits. And that will tell you whether your fertility is being impacted or uh, worsened by any of your lifestyle habits. The reason we say that is obviously a 30-day period involves a lot of um, hormonal work that is happening in the body. Around day 14 is when an egg is released in a normal period cycle. Seven days from that is when there is peak progesterone level. And if that peak progesterone level, which is a 250 rupee test at least in India, it's very easy to do. Often we don't need prescriptions in India. It's a simple you know, at-home collection sample. 250 rupees will tell you if your progesterone is higher than 7.8, there is a good chance that you have ovulated in that period and that your ovulatory health is okay. But the peak value of progesterone we look for is 25. So the closer you get from 7.8 to 25, the better is your reproductive health. And any lifestyle changes you make as you proceed, that may be something that you want to check whether that is having a positive impact on your fertility. Beautiful, Mahesh. And I think uh, we have a lot of listeners in the US and I know that there is a lot of uh, confusion over serum lab versus the Dutch test. Personally, what are your views on that? Yeah, so I think the Dutch test is indeed a very beautiful way of understanding how hormones are working in women's bodies because obviously the complexity of hormones is far wider in women. However, when um, Dutch obviously stands for dried urine test of comprehensive hormones, so it is a urinary sample and it is measuring metabolites or downstream breakdown of hormones. So yes, I do use it when we need it, but it is a rather expensive test and it therefore must be used when it is appropriate. So if we are going to, for example, give DHEA as a supplement to a lady who's facing low ovarian reserve issues and advanced maternal age suggests that she needs that help, since DHEA is a top hormone, something that is at the fountainhead of all the downstream hormones, you may want to observe, is the DHEA going towards the estradiol that you want to want it to go towards the female hormone that helps ovulation rather than go towards more DHT or dihydrotestosterone, which is a male hormone that can both hamper ovulation and produce cystic acne. So it's a very sort of, you know, you should know why you're using it and how you're going to use it. That is number one. Secondly, I do like the Dutch plus test for a morning cortisol awakening salivary response. So when when you do the saliva testing as part of the Dutch test, then sleep you are able to judge very well. So if you are getting that awakening cortisol response within the first hour of waking up, is your cortisol starting low and literally ramping up to double within the first hour or so? That determines whether you're bounding out of bed full of beans to do the day's work or you're dragging yourself with aches and pains in the first hour and can't open your eyes without coffee. So that kind of gives me a read of the entire sleep cycle that happened the previous night. But for fertility, I would say that serum progesterone is a far well-established test. Let's jump into talking about men. You did sprinkle in a little bit when we were talking about women, but how is sleep impactful on male sexuality and fertility? Yeah. And absolutely. So, you know, um, we get enough. Um, so we work with couples at Sepalik. We try uh, to work with both um, sort of partners. And sleep has been shown in a very large Australian study, um, you know, literally uh, 
thousands of couples, 1700 couples, if memory serves, where they, uh, you know, uh, made sure that they had held for all other factors. So they adjusted for other factors and they found that men who were consistently getting less than six hours of sleep had a huge drop in their sperm quality as well as in the fertility uh, pregnancy outcomes of the couple per se. So yes, spermatogenesis is again one of those rest and digest processes. The body is able to prioritize reproduction only when your own health and happiness is good. So if you're not sleeping well, you're not rested well, you're in a fight or flight state, obviously the body is not going to want you to reproduce at that time. So it seems very commonsensical. However, it does help in the modern age to have a study that backs it up. So certainly spermatogenesis, there is a huge impact. Further, from my own clinical practice, I have found that even when men have normal sperm count, motility and morphology, all three gross parameters are fine. If sleep is disturbed, often we get poor responses in the DNA fragmentation index, which means when you go beyond the gross parameters and see, is the sperm adequate in terms of its DNA structure? Is it going to lead to an embryo that has an aneuploidy of some sort? Uh, you know, is there going to be an embryo that is not healthy enough to become a healthy child? In such cases, a DNA fragmentation index test is done for men as well. So when we look at DNA quality of men who have poor sleep and they, you know, fill that in the form, they tell us, I've always slept five hours, six hours. I use alcohol to fall asleep. You know, whenever we get that kind of a case history and we look at the DFI, there seems to be a correlation that we find in the clinic. So certainly it's affecting gross reproductive parameters as well as subtle reproductive parameters in men as well. And I know that we did talk about this whole aspect of the gap at the beginning. And when someone does require fertility treatments like IVF, I personally know so many people who've gone through so many rounds of it. Uh, how can, does good sleep, does optimizing sleep support that process in terms of the outcome? And we did promise our listeners at the beginning that we would answer this question, which is very key because it can save them going through several rounds of these treatments. So how does sleep behave? And you just described, so I'm, first of all, I'm appreciative that there is someone who's working in the space of fertility who's covering all these aspects, which I call non-negotiable. So how does that impact better outcome in fertility? Yeah, so absolutely. Again, I keep saying this, you know, I, I tell people just use common sense. One third of your life you spend sleeping, right? So surely it's going to have an impact on so many things. So what can one do? So I'm sure listeners to your podcast have been, uh, you know, uh, had the good fortune of being exposed to so many experts who give them the sort of sleep hygiene advice that, you know, that they should follow, switching off devices, not just blue light blocking, but literally winding yourself down with slower activities towards your, you know, getting ready into that sleep cycle, even intelligent uh, and a uh, little bit further away things like setting aside time in your daytime to actually re-evaluate and replay some of the events that have happened during the day, especially the more disturbing ones, so that the brain feels like those have been processed already and it doesn't have to reprocess it during your sleep by bringing those negative spirals back, you know, some argument that you had. Instead, you at least put a temporary bow on it during lunchtime. You realize the morning the argument has happened, run it through your head, just do a little bit of play acting and say, okay, now I've learned this lesson and this is how I'm going to not let it happen again or this is how I'm going to react better. Just having that little bit of a putting a pin in it, as they call it, can make a huge difference to your sleep quality. And certainly, um, we do all the interventions basis the specific, uh, you know, inputs that people give in their form. So, for example, you may be eating a very carb-led meal at night because you do not, because that is your um, sort of comfort meal, right? All of us get to spend time with family. So, family meals have to be about happiness. And happiness naturally comes from glucose. That is how we are hardwired because sugar was so difficult to find during our hunting gathering days. So if you have a sharp sugar spike that takes place immediately after dinner, it means that insulin is going to rush in 
from your pancreas into your blood and push all that sugar into your cells so somewhere around the middle of the night or 2 3 hours into bed your blood sugar may actually crash as a result of the high insulin which is going to wake you up so now you have a cortisol response because the brain is telling your adrenal hey i want sugar to do all this fellow's dreamings and set his memories right and yet this fellow has no sugar so please go to the liver and pull out stored sugar and put it into the blood stream and naturally when cortisol is high it's a fight or flight response so you wake up with a start so one of the simple things we would give uh, you know a lot of people advise on at dinner is try to keep dinner light even if you're doing comfort foods be careful in the way in which you stage those components of the meal eat the salad chew it really well try to avoid raw salads at night but even if you're doing a steamed salad chew it really well let your stomach fill you know eat like a european don't eat european food necessarily as an indian but eat like a european stretch your meal out a little all of us you know lot of us middle class indians are used to gobbling up our food because we were large families and the nicest things that a meal got quickly disappeared from the table right so don't gobble up your meals eat it slowly and you will find that your blood sugar is far more steady through the night so you don't wake up and if you don't wake up your body is going to secrete the growth hormone the melatonin all the things that support fertility this is you know one of the important things secondly we tell people if you do need some melatonin support work with an expert and yes people come to us on a clock as you can imagine deepa you know as an online clinic we are often the last port of call seldom the first port of call people have gone through all kinds of treatments not succeeded then they come to us so you know all our 19 babies are like that they're all refractory cases so when they come to us like that they're already very distraught there is a whole uh you know fear of a clock oh my god this has to happen fast otherwise this will happen that will happen we often tell them to just we help to calm them down we teach them simple breath techniques so another one i'd like to share with your listeners is a simple double breath technique so you do a deep inhale and then you do a short further inhale on top of it so you do then there is a long exhale through the mouth so what are we doing we are literally mimicking how a child finishes crying so if you ever see a child crying they go <laughs> so that's the last one just so it lets your brain know that i'm done with my stressor i know how this is over so now i can switch into a parasympathetic state so if you've got your brain racing away when you're lying in bed then use this double breath technique and you'll find that you kind of calm down literally immediately after but if you still have issues of waking up especially around 2 to 4 or so on once we have addressed the fundamentals like you know eating right etc melatonin has by itself been proven to be a huge support in people who are melatonin deficient but use it carefully and use it for limited periods of time don't become dependent on it it's not habit forming but certainly small doses of melatonin 500 uh, mcg maximum sort of you know getting into a 1 mg that kind of a dose could certainly help and these are available over the counter in india but be careful in how you use them right so i would some of these are little tips that people maybe can use i appreciate the two things you shared mahesh one is the bow tie on the problem because i know that that is a huge thing for a lot of people when you wake up in the middle of the night and you haven't resolved those emotions and the problem seems to appear much more scary in the middle of the night and that can be very frightening and love that you shared that uh, and also you just shared right now um about you know just uh, that deep breath and uh, babies tend really have a way of gaining their own resilience so beautifully um and we went through a lot of information however i do want to have some specific action about take away so what would you say would be the three uh ways in which women and men can support their fertility health as well as maybe support themselves if they are looking for fertility treatments fantastic so i would say for sure you know the sleep hygiene would be like the bedrock i keep going back to this and not just because you're a sleep expert but because there is nothing else that we do for one third of the day 
right? So 24 hours, eight hours you spend this. We tell people, you know, um, losing your sleep um, quality is often like losing your eyesight in school. You know, it's only when the next kid is able to see the blackboard and you're not, only then you realize that you need specs. So it's a gradual decline. You may think six hours is enough for you, but the toll it's taking on you quietly in your sperm quality, in your egg quality, you don't realize. So work with a sleep expert, use all the tips that are possible. First, fix your sleep before anything else. Sometimes it may need uh, technical help in terms of how to eat right to support sleep how to cool your room to uh, support sleep and so on. So, but, you know, that's the core. Second thing I would say is we tell all our patients, your reproductive health is like the fifth floor of a five-story building. It begins, the bedrock would be the diet that you eat, the food that you're putting into your body. So your right balance of proteins, carbs, and fats. Many women wrongly think eating a lot of protein is going to make them, you know, uh, get pregnant, especially in an Indian scenario. That's not true. Many times it's the fat that is lacking. And the fat is the precursor to all the steroidal hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, etc. So adequate fat. So you know that's your foundation, number one. Second, above that, I would put the sleep. And these two are obviously connected to each other. Beyond that would be vitamins and minerals that you never thought of as directly Im impacting fertility. D3, B12, iron, zinc, we find these are so crucial. We've had so many cases where we just do that and things get fixed. And then on top of that is your thyroid health, which is the fourth floor because it is the master gland. All these three floors could work well, but if you're in a fight or flight situation, your brain will turn down your metabolism using thyroid as the master switch. And you will have enough energy for your own life, but not to create a new one. So this is suboptimal thyroid. You're not frankly hypothyroid yet, but you have suboptimal thyroid health. And finally, the fifth floor is the reproductive health. So we often tell people, when you go to gynex or IVF specialists, if the fifth floor is shaking, they're trying to hold the walls of the fifth floor by putting buttresses on the fifth floor. Instead of saying the common sense, are the four floors below working or not? If those are stable, if you're eating right, if your vitamins are fine, if you're sleeping right, your thyroid is fine, nature naturally wants you to reproduce. It has no other dictum for you. So anytime you've got a fertility issue, always ask, is my own life in good health or not? So that is what I would say. And, you know, not just Sepalika, there are enough fertility coaches now. We use what we call a five-petal program. So we help you with your diet, your dietary supplements. Ayurvedic acupressure using small magnets. We use Ayurvedic home remedies like little jeera, methi that is available in your kitchen. And finally, we use lifestyle changes like the breathing and the sleep hacks that we mentioned. This is a guided six month journey. And the reason we say you please do this for six months. And my hope is that one day when couples get married, they'll be handed out Sepalika gift certificate that whenever you want to conceive according to your own career plans and all, just give us six months. Because the life of an egg in a lady, the oocyte, is 205 days as measured by modern science from the various stages of development. We only see the last 14 days of ovulation whenever we read any Google article. You know, in a period cycle, we say day zero to day 14 is ovulation. That is the tip of the iceberg. There is more, so much more that happens in that 205 day journey. So give us 180 of those days. And we'll help you get the egg to such a wonderful quality. Your child will thank you for life. And that uh, to me is the right way to do it. That's how we did it traditionally also. From, you know, the simple milk and badam that was given during the first conjugal night of the couple onwards, we started building their foundations. We made them so strong that the natural energy created the new life. That is the way that I feel, you know, everybody should look at their fertility. Very important, Mahesh. And those nutrients you described, the iron, the D3, the B12, the zinc, they're also key nutrients in thyroid health itself. And I often see a lot of people deficient in most of those. Um, and you did say methi jeera. I'd like you to break that down in English because a lot of listeners are in the US and I'm sure that they would love to know uh, maybe one hack which they can use at home. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I, I will, of course, translate the, so the methi is fenugreek. 
and the uh, jira is cumin so uh, but we leave those aside because those aren't the key ones if i have to pick one then i would pick nuts and seeds as your primary fertility vehicle right so from that little nut or seed is going to grow a giant tree or plant so it has all the packed nutrients in it so if the only thing is obviously no tree wants to be eaten by you so there is a way to process that nut and seed to ensure that it works right so i'll just give the simple one that uh, you know easily also widely known but let's remind people so in the first half of your period make sure that you do the flax seed and the pumpkin that is the flap the easy way to remember so day 0 to day 14 do the flap one tablespoon each of flax seed and pumpkin seed preferably soaked overnight to remove the anti nutrients coated on it mimicking spring as if it's rained on top of the seed so it releases the nutrients and it's ready for processing so do that in the first half second half do suzi which is your sunflower seeds and sesame seeds you know again process them in the same way so flap in the first half suzi in the second half one tablespoon of each your estrogen will be supported beautifully your progesterone will be supported beautifully you'll get uh, lots of proteins uh, amino acids through the seeds and it's all going to help you this is very simple do it at home uh, there's nobody for whom i can think of this being contra indicated unless you're allergic to nuts and seeds that's the only thing um yeah and mahesh you did say uh, d0 to d14 however i must ask you and we are almost out of time but given that pcos conditions like that are very much interlinked with poor fertility and someone doesn't have a 30 day cycle then what do they do yeah so they still cycle in 15 days our primary program which sepalika started with is a pcod program and we have treated uh, close to about 650 women with this condition now and our answer is always the same so whenever you get your next period start with the flap do it for 15 days then switch over to the suzi irrespective of whether the period comes or not with this stimulation automatically the body will come back into a regular cycle by itself so anywhere in the middle if you have to start without understanding what part of the cycle you're on start with the flap perfect mahesh where can people go to find you and know about your work so sepalika is the name of the clinic it's uh, you know uh, spelt s e p a l i k a it is the singhalese term for the night jasmine or the parijat flower we uh, you know wanted to have a symbol that showed that outward beauty comes as a result of inner health and the night jasmine flower has beautiful anti helminthic anti bacterial properties and you know in many places in sri lanka they still boil the flowers and use the decoction for fevers and for bacterial infections etc so go to sepalika.com we've worked for nearly 3 years before even setting up the clinic just putting together a wealth of information on blogs which are free all written by experts be careful to make sure these are not just google driven articles but actually validated with all the research references so please use any of those resources and feel free to write in to us you can write to us at thrive at sepalika.com and we'll be happy to answer whatever question you have beautiful thank you mahesh for your time today and maybe at some point we'll get a little deeper into male fertility thank you so much thanks for the opportunity to publish everybody vibrant health and well being fertility is something that we all need to bring attention to While this episode did go into how women and men can improve fertility outcomes the truth is that we all need to reduce stress and improve our body's output of sex hormones in times of high stress our body uses excess cortisol in an attempt to protect us from those challenges this depletes sex hormone production and can lead to mood fluctuations anxiety and depression Two weeks ago, my father passed away. Normally, I count myself as having high resilience to stress, but the depletion I felt afterwards—just that high adrenal times at the hospital—was followed by this immense crash. It instantly impacted my menstrual cycle, 
left me with fatigue, tearfulness and lack of focus, all of which of course was connected to grief itself. I knew that pushing myself to work in these times would only cause further challenges to a sensitive time of perimenopause. So I took a conscious decision to only do as much as I could each day. This was really hard for me. I sent emails to some that I could not meet. I ignored my to-do lists which was really difficult for me and I let myself cry whenever it came naturally. I urge you to let go of that control when you feel overwhelmed. Just focus on loving yourself and your body. This really is one of the most powerful tools in recovery, fertility included. Have a great day and lots of love. Hi everyone, I hope you enjoyed the show today. Just a reminder that this podcast is for information purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or otherwise qualified health professional. This information is provided on the understanding that it does not constitute medical or the professional advice or services. If you are looking for personal help on your health journey, do seek out a qualified professional. Please do make your own healthcare decisions based upon your research and in partnership with a qualified healthcare professional. It is in no way intended as medical advice or a treatment or cure for any condition. Be sure to always directly work with a qualified practitioner before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle that may feel out of your realm of comfort or understanding. If you are looking for an allied functional medicine practitioner, do seek out more information on www.phytothrive.com. It is important that you have someone who is qualified and understands your health personally in order to provide adequate care, especially when it comes to chronic health condition. Be sure to subscribe to the Sleep Whisperer podcast on your favorite podcast app to get each episode as soon as it launches.